great morning, huh? Hey, before I start my message, I want to share with you something very quickly about something that we're going to be doing. I shared with you just, uh, just briefly a little time last week, a couple of months ago, but today it's actually, we're going to begin to announce it now. Before I do kindergarten, first and second graders, you may be dismissed. Kindergarten, first and second grade, Miss Carrie is back there, so you'll go and have a great time and we'll see you uh, in just a little while. For the last several months, we've been praying, and, and actually for the last year or so, God has been burdened on my heart about us hosting here at First Baptist West for ourselves a Bible conference. And what God has laid on my heart to do is call it the Immerse Bible Conference, and that's going to be March 27th and 28th. That's on a Friday night and Saturday. And so what we're going to do is through this time, we're going to have a great worship service on Friday night, so we want you to come. We have uh, some guest speakers and musicians coming, and they'll be uh, doing that for us on Friday night. Then on Saturday morning, we're going to, we brought in, and, and the, the staff and I have been working on uh, some breakout sessions and titles and categories that I think you're going to really uh, enjoy, but also benefit greatly from. And we're going to have four sessions of breakouts that are going to last about 45 minutes, and now we'll have two sessions. Then we'll have lunch, then we'll have two more sessions, and it'll be over with by 2 o'clock. And then that evening, we'll have ba gather back together for a dinner and worship service uh, that night and close out. This will be in lieu of our, our revival this year. But God has burdened my heart about this, and it's called immersed because I really sense that God is calling for His people to really have an in-depth uh, relationship with Him. And that's why we're having this immersed conference. Now, I want to encourage you that starting next week we'll give you more details we're going to list out all of the uh, the breakouts and who we have coming to teach those sessions and again i know you're going to enjoy it but we're also going to, because we're going to be having a lunch and some little breakfast stuff the the, the conference itself for saturday is going to cost ten dollars a person but child care is absolutely free so if you say well man i can't afford me and my kids and well if you'll just it's ten dollars for those attending the conference but we're going to have child care free for everybody up to sixth grade. So we don't want to give, have anybody have a reason not to come to this conference. We will be encouraging you to invite people to come and be a part of that. And we're going to start registration uh, next Sunday. We'll, in the bulletin, we'll have all the breakouts. Everything is lined up. We just want to kind of break it out to you in stages. But also be in prayer about this time. I believe God is really going to move through this Bible conference. And if you say, well, I'm not really interested in those, t in those breakout sessions, I don't know why you wouldn't be, because once you see them, I think you're really going to want to be a part of them. But we still want you to still come on, on Saturday, Friday night and Saturday night to our revival services. So we'll be taking up love offerings there, but the conference itself is just $10 for anyone who attends the, the Saturday breakouts. So that'll be coming. So even now, start praying for our breakout session, our Bible studies, and everything that we're going to be doing for our Immerse Bible Conference, March 27th and 28th. We want you to be a part of that with us, okay? Today we're going to continue with the idea of getting people to Jesus. So what I want to do is I want you to have your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 1. We're going to be reading ver through verse 10. This is two very familiar parables uh, about finding the lost and what God is calling us to do as a church. Luke chapter 15 Starting at verse 1, reading through verse 10. So go ahead and stand with me today in honor of reading God's word as we look and we see how God is going to deal with our hearts this morning. The Bible says in verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and, and the sinners drew near to him, being Jesus, uh, and, and to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine and in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders in rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the great time we had this morning already through our praise and worship, through the celebration of, 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 of baptism for Kyle. And God, we just want to continue with that amazing spirit in this place. Lord, as I share the message that you've laid on my heart, I pray, Father, that every word I say will not be my word, but be yours. I pray, Father, that, the, that this is not my message, but your message. And Father, I pray that the response would be as you desire for it to be. And God, it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. This morning, we're looking at getting people to Jesus. That's what we're going to be looking at in our new beginnings. The whole sections for this year is a new beginning for First Baptist West, a new focus, a revival, if you will. And part of that is now in this series of messages entitled Getting People to Jesus. Last week, we shared about uh, the four friends who took their one friend uh, who was paralyzed, tore open the roof, set this person down in the front, and lowered him down, and took him to Jesus. And what it took for them to do that. Today, what I want to look at are two parables that Jesus tells to people and the reason he told them these parables is you'll remember when what he, they were upset that he was actually having sinners come to him and listen to him and he was sitting down and he was actually dealing with them tax collectors and sinners man all sorts of of, of of people that they wouldn't have anything to do with and so when Jesus knew their heart he then told them these two parables so what I want to look at this morning very quickly if you will are basically this thought being a part of some, uh, bringing someone to Jesus is about the most fulfilling thing a person can do. Being a part of that. Man, if you've, if you've ever had the opportunity that someone has come to you or you've gone to them and you've prayed with them and then all of a sudden they realize, they realize they need Jesus and you get an opportunity to lead them to the, to the, to the cross and, you, and they, they become saved through uh, giving their life to Jesus through your work. Man, I'm telling you, you, you want to talk about an amazing feeling. Amen. But let me tell you something. It's not only that, but if you, uh, as a church, man, as you're praying for people, as you're encouraging people, and, and through our ministries at First Baptist West, someone comes to know Jesus as their Savior, we should be fulfilled as a church. Amen? And now listen, why should we be so fulfilled as a church when, because with Kyle and others who have received Jesus this year already, listen, do you realize you as a church has had a big part in that? And you ought to feel excited about it because we ought to be fulfilled because this is what Jesus even has us here for, is to preach the gospel, present the gospel, and lead people to Jesus. We fulfilled the purpose. Wow, how much better can it get than that? Amen? And so that's why we ought to be excited about this, bringing people to Jesus. And what I want to look at today in these two verse, in these two texts, these two parables are four common words of, that I believe are very significant. And they're common in, in, in both parables. The first word is this, lost. In each of these parables, each one had something that was lost. Now, in this loss, what it means here is separated from. It's, and sometimes I think we don't really understand what lost is because we got to know that lost is being separated. The Bible says that our sins have separated us from God. So someone who is lost is separated. Here's God. Here they are with absolutely no chance on their own getting back. And so we see here there were two items in each of the parables, one each, that something was separated from God. Now let me, let me share this with you though. We've got to understand that being lost is not a behavioral problem. And so too often, I believe even in the church, if we're not careful, we work hard at trying to same change someone's behavior. And we want them to act better, deal better, do better, talk better, speak, think better, act better, do all these things. So we, we try and we try to get them to change their behavior. But may I share something with you? That because being lost is not a behavior problem, changing their behavior does not change their condition. They can be out here and be a nice boy and girl now, a nice man and woman now, because they have changed, they've kicked some bad habits, they've transformed, they've changed their life up. But guess what? They're still what? Lost. Why? Because not that they're bad boys or girls, but because they are separated from God. 
Amen? So it's not a behavior problem. I think a lot of times, if we're not careful, we, we want to change the morality of America. But do you know what, my friends? If we change the morality of America, we're still going to have a lost America. America is separated from God. Those who are lost are separated. But it's also not just a mindset. I think we, we get this idea that it's just the way they think. Man, if we could just change the way they think about things. Man, if we could get them to change the way they think about abortion. If we could change the way they think about homosexuality. If we could change the way they think about all of these items out there. But we've got to understand, again, because it's not a mindset, that unless they change and come to Christ, they're still lost. And so we see then that in this world there are basically two types of people, two groups. There's not three, there's not four, there's not five. There's two groups. The, the first one is there are those who are lost, those separated from God due to sin in their lives. Then there are those who are saved. The saved are those having fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. That's how, that's the two types. There's not someone that is almost saved or there's not someone that is almost lost. They are either lost or they're saved. If you'll remember when Jesus was talking, uh, when Paul was talking and, and he was talking to one of the kings, and he said, King Agrippa, and he was telling him all about coming to Jesus. And, and Agrippa looked at him and said, Paul, almost, almost you persuaded me to become a Christian. Well, do you know what that meant about Agrippa? He was still lost. Amen? So, folks, listen to me. You can't be almost saved. You can't barely miss it. Because if you miss it, you miss it. Hey, I remember several times in the years that I was coaching. Man, we had some very intense basketball games when I was coaching. I remember on several occasions getting the last shot. And I remember, man, one or two in particular, that they would shoot that ball. And that ball would hit that rim. And that ball would roll down and get almost three quarters into that rim. Man, it was... And it would spin one or two more times, and you know what it would do? Pop out. Horn blows, game over. Oh, we, boy, that shot was right there, man. It was three quarters of the way in. It rolled around three times. It even touched the net, but it popped out. And do you know what they determined about my team? We lost. Almost. Three quarters of the way in. And that thing still, Jimmy, I don't know how. It's like God himself reached down and said, nope, not today, Harold. <laughs> testing me, he was, testing me. But you know what? There was a winner that day, and there was a team that lied. I wasn't going to say losers because we weren't losers. There was a team that won and a team that lost. Now, I know in our day and times, we'd like to say everybody wins. You know what? Everybody keeps score in your mind, right? We know who won and who lost. But here's the fact. They realized that something was separated. Something was lost. My friends, listen to me. We must understand today that there are people who are lost. Not people who are almost saved. Not people who are way, way lost. There are people that are lost. They are separated from God. And they must come to fellowship with him through and only through Jesus Christ. They realize that. The Bible tells us, says this, At that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But listen, what else? But now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, separated, having been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. You were separated, but now you're not. You were lost, but now you're saved. Amen? And so this is what they understood, that there was something that was valuable to them, and it was separated. It was lost. Then the second one word that I believe of common significance was found. They were lost, but it was found. In this found, we realized that effort was made. Amen? There was an effort made. By the shepherd and by the woman. They realized the loss was there. 
they realized the condition and they began to go out. They took the initiative to go. So there was an effort on both of their parts. Jesus said in Luke 19, uh, like Luke 19, 10 says this, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I see that separated. I'm going to come, come from heaven. I'm going to come down. I'm going to seek those out. I'm going to save those who will come to me and that I make the effort. My friend, listen to me. There needs to be an effort on the church's behalf to go out and reach people for Jesus because we find out here the lost did not search. Amen? The lost were separated, but who did the searching? The lady cleaned the house. The shepherd left and went out looking. So we see that the, the search, the, the lost don't search. And so, so often if we're not careful, even in the church, as I shared last week, we can have a field of dreams mentality where, oh, if we'll have service, they'll come because they're searching for something. My friend, listen to me. They are, the lost are searching for something, but here's the deal. There is so much out there to find that they get distracted from the truth. And so what we must be doing is we must then take that truth and go out to them. You know, we sing Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but what? Now I'm found. Not that I found, not that I went looking, not that I find it, but I was lost, but now I'm found. Jesus came looking for me. I had people in my, in my life, in my school, my senior year, and even before that, I had teachers who were helping search for me. And because of their work, I became found. I didn't go looking. They came looking for me. But we also see this. They didn't give up. The Bible says here that in each of these texts that they searched until he or she found what they were looking for. They didn't give up. They didn't make it a special event. They didn't make it a one-time thing that we're going to gather together and we're going to have a revival. We're going to invite people. And boy, once we hope a lot come to be saved then because by the end of the service that week, we're done and we're going to wait until next year. My friend, listen to me. It doesn't work that way. They kept going until that lost was found. It wasn't a one-time event. It wasn't one spectacular thing. It wasn't one spectacular cleaning. It wasn't one spectacular sweeping of the, of, the, of, of the wilderness. They went and they kept looking and looking and looking until that lost was found. My friends, listen to me. We need to keep doing it. The thing about finding those who are lost does not mean that the first time we go talk to them that they're going to turn around, that they're going to come to Jesus. It may take time after time after time living with them, loving them, guiding them, encouraging them, letting them see Christ in us. It may take a long time to find that which was lost. But we don't give up. They didn't give up. Neither of them gave up, and we see the results. The third word, very quickly, the third word that I want to look at is the word one. That one is something of significant value. It meant something to them. They loved that item. They realized that item was no longer there. And they realized that it was lost. It was separated out. And that one was so significant to them, they went out looking for it. They cleaned the house looking for it. And so many times, if we're not careful, we get blinded by the idea of the, of, of the masses. And we get to thinking about the group and what ends up happening is somebody from our group may not even be there anymore and we don't even realize they're gone because we're focused on the one, on the group. What, what, I, what I look at here is say, the, the, the shepherd could have said, well, you know, I, I got, I had a hundred. One of them separated, but boy, you know what? I got 99. That's pretty good. And I want to keep watch on that 99. That one, don't know what happened to them. Don't know why they decided, but you know, they're gone. But I got 99. The woman with the coins didn't say, well, I lost one coin, but praise the Lord, I got nine more. So you know what? I'm, I'm going to focus on the nine. And that one, I don't know where it is. And if it really is tired and really is ready, it'll come back. Didn't happen. They searched. Listen, my friends. 
even for those in our church and in our small groups, in our deacons, as our family groups. I'm not talking about just lost people now. I'm talking about people who may have wandered off from the church, wandered off from your small groups. Listen, if we're not careful, sometimes we could say, well, you know what? We got, we got this group. We lost a few, but hey, we still got them. We get blinded by this when we need to be concerned about those who are no longer coming. Those of our family groups who may not be here any longer, find out why. You know one thing that I've found out, and here's something I've asked my deacons to do, and I've asked my my staff to do as well, is I've asked them to begin to look over their list, look over their family ministries, look over their Sunday school list, and if there's anybody at any time God says, lay somebody on your heart, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for them, and then I want you to do something. I know this gets a little difficult. I want you to find out about them. If God lays them on your heart, go ask them. Because I said, you know one thing I found out? And I've, I've made this a practice. I've tried to do this in my own personal life. And one thing that I found out, friends, not everybody's not coming because they're upset at us. Or maybe they just wanted some time off. But you know why I found out that sometimes they're not coming because they're going through a very difficult time in their life. And the one thing that we're all prone to do when we hit difficult times is not come with a big group of people. Not come around people who are all happy patting each other on the back. So we pull ourselves away. Sometimes we'll find out those people are going through the most difficult times of their life and they don't know what to do. They need to, show, they need to know somebody cared. So here, I'm going to tell you as a church, be like my staff. Be like our deacons. Man, if God lays somebody on your heart, find out about them. Don't get so, well, we got, we got 300 coming to our church. All right, two left off. Well, you know, they're all right. No, we ought to care enough about them to find out. Because they may be needing us. They may be needing us. Small groups or large congregation, we still need to be concerned about a one. A one. Because all matter. And the last word, very quickly, the last word that I have is uh, rejoicing. In both of these texts, we find at the end, when they were found, they both rejoiced. And the Bible says they said, come, rejoice with me. This was a big deal. Rejoice with me. I want to share this thought with you. My friends, salvation is a pretty big deal. Let me say that again. (laughs) Salvation is a pretty big deal. For Kyle, that was a pretty big deal. For his parents, it was a pretty big deal. For the pastor, it was a pretty big deal. Hey, the Bible says for the angels in heaven, it was a pretty big deal. For every person in here, if you've been saved, man, it's a big deal. Why do we celebrate it? Because it's a big deal. Now listen, I want you to notice something about that phrase I put on the, on the screen here. Where I said salvation is a pretty big deal. Now, I re- now remember, I was a math teacher. They also made me a couple times teach English, which I wasn't really great at. So I found out if you don't really know a lot about it and know how to teach, you ought not teach it. Amen? But I did. But I knew enough to say that at the end of a statement like this, there should be an exclamation mark. But you notice I have a comma. That wasn't a mistake. You know why there's a comma there? Something else is coming. And here's that something else. Salvation is a pretty big deal. But only if the thought of remaining separated is tragic. You get that? Salvation is a really big deal if we realize that that person we care about, that person that we love, that husband or wife or mom or dad or kid or partner that we work with at work, or someone that we see on a daily basis, if, we mean, if they mean something to us, and realizing, oh my goodness, they are lost, they are separated from God. And unless they change their condition, not their behavior, not their mindset, unless they change and come to Jesus uh, and by forgiveness of their sin, they are going to remain lost. And listen to me, being lost on earth is not the same thing as being lost in eternity. Because even being lost on earth, you still experience some of the grace of God. Do you realize that? You could be lost here today and enjoy this service, couldn't you? That's part of the grace of God given to all people. But listen to me. 
When a person steps into eternity separated from God, it will be the worst thing that we could even imagine in our lives. And folks, listen to me. If you don't care that someone you love is going to have that happen, then salvation, them getting saved isn't a big deal. Right? Oh, but if you realize what that really means, that your mom or your dad, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your cousin, your aunt, your, your neighbors, your people you work with, people that you spend a lot of time with, the students that you go to school with, that one day, oh, listen to me, one day they will all step into eternity just like all of us. And if it's not tragic on your heart that that person is going to die separated from God, then salvation can't be a big deal. But oh, listen to me. When you realize how what being lost is, man, when the kinders realize what Kyle being lost really meant, I promise you, they didn't want that for their son. And boy, when he came to the salvation, woo! Yeah. Amen? Amen. Because it was a tragedy for him to be lost. That's why they said, hey, come rejoice with us. Why do, you, why do you think we clap? Why do you think we cheer? Why do you think we pat them on the back? Why do you think we say, praise the Lord, someone has come to Jesus? Because them not coming to Jesus is tragedy. They said, come, celebrate with us, rejoice with us. For that which was lost, we have now found it. And likewise, I say to you, there will be more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents. Mm. So I want to wrap this up. My time is about up. But I want to ask you two questions. The first one is really, really important, so please listen. If you're sitting here, if you're listening uh, at home, please listen. My first question is, are you the lost one? All of us, listen to me, all of us need to answer that question. Not because I'm trying to get you to doubt your salvation, but I'm asking you, has there been a point in your life that you realized you were separated from God and you needed him and you came to saving grace of Jesus Christ and you've repented of your sin? You asked Jesus, the only sacrifice for us, by which men can be saved, that you ask him to come into your life and to save you. Are, you. are you that one? Or have you not done that? Listen, my friend, if you've not done that, today is the day of salvation. Today, I believe God is already speaking to your heart. Even when I ask that question, I believe somebody in here, somebody watching this thing, somebody knows that you are perhaps that one. Then I want to offer you today the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. You don't have to change your mindset. You don't even have to change your behavior. Now, I know that change, people ask me, well, preacher, I don't want to change the way I am. I'm not asking you to change. Now, I know that may sound tough from a, a pastor telling you I'm not worried about you changing, because I'm not, because I believe the Holy Spirit, if you get saved, he'll change you. You don't have to do it. And I don't have to make you do it. So what I'm saying is if you're here today, I don't want you to change your behavior. I don't want to change your mindset. Why don't you change your condition to come to Jesus? Are you that one? Secondly, the second question are those for those of you who are saved. Can I ask you just real quick, do you have a one? Do you have somebody that, that you know or you believe in your heart that may be lost? Now I'm going to ask you this. You don't have to raise your hand, but did you think of somebody just now? Maybe thought of more than one, but did you think of one? Can I, can I ask you this? Would it be amazing to you if that one came to Jesus? Or is it not a big deal? Well, we hope they would. Because here's what I believe. That if I asked you that question and God laid somebody on your mind, I believe that is the one he wants for you right now. Doesn't mean it's the only one, but I believe there is one that he laid on your, he, he, he did it, I didn't. 
You say, well, I thought it was long. No, if, if I asked you that question and somebody came to your mind, that was your one. Listen, here's the deal. If God brought that person to your mind, I believe that he's also working on that person right now. Amen. Or he wouldn't have brought them to your mind. He'd have brought somebody else. Make sense? Do you have a one? Is there somebody that God spoke to your mind? It may have only been that fast. You now may be trying to reason out why you even thought of them other than that God may want you to go talk to them or live a life pleasing to God in front of them. But I'm here to tell you, I believe the Holy Spirit is powerful enough that if I asked you that question and someone came to your mind, that is your one right now. That's the one you need to start talking to. I don't mean you got to go preach a sermon to them. But I believe that's the one you got to go start sharing life with. Sharing Jesus with them as much as you can. That's your one. So, I'm done. But I hope the Holy Spirit didn't. If you're here today and you need Jesus in your heart, man, I want you to pray. God, forgive me of my sin. I claim Jesus in my life. As my sacrifice, I know he died for me. I know he's alive again, and I ask him to forgive me and come into my life. If you're here in this congregation or you're watching this on, on live stream, you have an opportunity right now to come to Jesus. Would you come? It is, listen to me, it is a big deal. It is a big deal. And would you now begin to pray, Lord, you laid this one on my heart. Please give me opportunities. Place in front of me opportunities to love them, to share with them. And let's do it right here during this praise and worship time. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for your love and your grace. God, we thank you for just speaking to us the way that you did. And Lord, I believe that there's someone here today. I believe there's someone viewing this live stream. I believe, Lord, that there's someone that needs Jesus. Oh, Father, I pray today that you would speak to them now. Draw them to you, Lord, like no one else can. You draw them to yourself, that they might come and be saved. And Father, I pray for those who are saved here today, those who know they have a relationship with you, those at home who know they have a relationship with you, that God, you would lay one on their mind, and you've already done that, I believe. Now I pray, Father, they would take advantage and opportunities that you lay out for them to share and to love on that one with the intent of coming to bringing them to Jesus. Father, use our church. Maybe there's someone in our, in our family groups. Maybe there's someone in our small groups. The Lord, we haven't seen in a while. We don't want to discount, discard them now. The Lord, maybe that's the one we need to go check on. Find out how desperately they may be in need of what we have to offer. Father, let this church be a church that does that. Let us begin right now during this time of praise and worship. My friends, listen to me. In just a moment, we're going to stand. If you prayed that prayer, man, we want to be down front. We want to help you. If you're at home and you've prayed that prayer, we want to hear from you. We want to help you in any way we can. But if you're here and you realize that there is one that God has laid on your heart, would you come this morning as well? Let's pray for them. I'll join praying with you. Barry will join in praying with you. Would you come this morning? Father, hear our prayer as we enter time, time of praise and worship again. Father, let us rejoice because we know one has come home. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to... I'm Harold Gacious, pastor of First Baptist West. I want to thank you for watching our service today and hope that you were able to feel the God's Spirit moving as we were able to here. And I want to always invite you to join us in person. If you're within driving distance, come and join us and we can worship together. But if not, continue to watch us in our live stream service as we will now, over the next few weeks, continue to be preaching on bringing people to Jesus. Our goal is is to make the church aware of the need that people have around us uh, for, for Jesus. And so that our hope is to bring people to that saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are needing anything that we can help you with, 
just please call us here at the church office and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to visit with you in any way that we can, help you in any way that we can. So we always want to welcome you and be a, be a loving church. And remember, at First Baptist West, we're people that love God, love people, and we want to see lives changed.